Good afternoon and welcome everyone to APN's live AREIT reporting season roundup webinar. Joining us today from APN's real estate securities team to run through the AREIT reporting season results, we have Michael Doble, Pete Morrissey, Mark Mazzarella and Matthew Coleman. Following today's presentation, which will run for about 20 minutes, we'll then have the opportunity for live Q&A. At any point throughout the presentation, you can send us a question by simply clicking on the grey box with a speech bubble on it, which can be found on the right hand side of your screen. We'll address as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. After today's live webinar, we'll email, uh, we'll email you a copy of the recording along with the presentation slides and a reporting season wrap article. I'll now hand over to the team to take you through the AREIT reporting season results. Well, thanks, Simone. Um, welcome all to the 2018 reporting season summary. The agenda today is to give an introduction to the sector, get through each of the individual key sectors in the AREIT market, retail, office, industrial, look at some key AREIT events, uh, update you on balance sheets and some value indicators, and then give a market outlook. So to kick off, by way of introduction, the macro themes pervading the market include uh, strengthening GDP, a read of about 3.4% at 30 June 2018 is a pretty solid metric. Inflation remaining low within the RBA's preferred uh, band. And interest rates steady with markets predicting little chance of an increase until late 2019. The major cyclical thematic impacting A rates is the, the low CPI feeding into weak wages, which is driving slow retail sales growth. It's important to note that this is not a structural issue. It's very much a cyclical theme. But structural issues remain. Disruptors are impacting the lesser quality real estate. And the main one, of course, is online. Online retail sales account for about 8.5% of total sales currently, and this is genuinely impacting the lesser quality real estate. We continue to prefer superior quality real estate at the top of the various hierarchies we invest in, so convenience and experience. Managers are being forced to work assets harder in this low growth environment. Mixed use strategies are emerging as managers seek to generate extra returns. Earnings growth in 2018 was attractive at around 4% compared to 2017. The outlook for 2019 earnings growth is equally attractive at 35 to 4%. Asset values continue to rise and NTA growth in FY18 was around 9.7%. Importantly, that was driven by rental growth as well as cap rate compression. Net property income growth at around 2.4% across the entire market was substantially driven by the stronger office market at 3.7%. The overall growth at 2.4 though is steady on growth rates seen over the last five years. Occupancy equally at around 98% is consistent with recent history too. Overall, we see the market reason as placed with reasonable value, trading at a discount of around 6% based on APN valuations. I'll now pass over to Pete Morrissey to talk retail. Thanks, Mike. The retail sector in Australia continues to have the highest barri barriers to entries across all of the core sectors. This has underpinned its success and that of the landlords that own it over many years. Today we see occupancy remaining very stable at around or over 99%. Some recovery in retail sales growth has been seen over the past year, but there is a variation at the state level. Examples of this were Victoria at over 4% growth, 
New South Wales at 2.8%, whilst Queensland and WA were significantly weaker. Shopping centre productivity or sales per square metre was up 3.1% over the year, a strong result. A re retail income growth or NPI was up 2.1%, but this was down from the full year 17 figure of 2.8%. Specialty shop sales growth of 1.7% was up from 1.1% in December, but was also down slightly on the FY17 result. GDP growth was better than expected as household consumption of discretionary and non-discretionary goods improved. This is what underpinned the second half improvement in sales. Consumer confidence, wages and online headwinds remain, but there are mixed signals in retail land. We believe the bar battle, which sees convenience and neighbourhood centres and catchment dominating centres, both regional and super regional, offering shopping, diversity and experiences along with services are assets that will continue to perform well. Assets lacking capital spend to reposition or differentiate them from competing centres may continue to struggle. This is reflected in the transactional market which has seen strong support at both ends of the barbell. Location, competition and management may determine the higher better use for some centres going forward. So in summary, the economic and sector headwinds means lower growth environment for retail is likely to prevail for the coming year. Some retail assets, notably the high street and sub-regional, will be exposed, but quality well-managed retail assets will continue to perform. I'll now hand over to Mark. Thanks, Pete. I'll be speaking about office. A-read office portfolios reported strong results over the 12-month period to June 2018. Solid operating results over the period were predominantly driven by stable occupancy across the A-read office portfolios, along with increasing rents in key eastern seaboard markets of Sydney and Melbourne. The headline strength in office portfolio performance can be attributed to like-for-like -like net income growth of 5.5%, up from 1.9% in June last year, suggesting solid income performance of existing portfolio assets. Tenant retention was 62%, which is considered healthy given the historically high level of tenant movement observed across office assets. This data point shows an improvement in occupants' willingness to remain in lease space and limits the cost of tenant churn to landlords, which can often be high. Releasing spreads of positive 6.3% were in line with the prior period and showed landlords have been able to achieve material increases as they release vacated or expired space. A reality also reflected by the increase in under-renting of 3.7%, suggesting income growth is likely to be sustained. Office portfolios also achieved sector-leading cap rate compression of 40 basis points, reflecting higher levels of investment demand, particularly for core assets located in the eastern seaboard markets. Indeed, A-rate portfolios are dominated by high-quality assets located in the CBD markets of Sydney and Melbourne, which have performed strongly in recent periods. The graph illustrated shows the total return outperformance of prime office assets located within Sydney and Melbourne has been particularly evident in recent periods. This trend is expected to continue, in our view, and be a positive for A-REIT investors, as our research suggests a compelling concentration of A-REIT office portfolios to these two markets in particular. Going forward, we anticipate future A-REIT office portfolio returns to be underpinned by sustained income growth to be supported by a persistent low vacancy and the monetization of growing market rents, and high levels of capital formation underpinning investment demand and valuation levels. 
I'll now pass on to Matthew who will update on industrial. Thanks Mark. Over the period, the industrial REITs reported solid results for FY18. Like for like income growth across the sector continued to improve up 60 basis points to 3.4% with demand conditions remaining robust and soft supply evident in prime markets. The Sydney and Melbourne industrial markets outperformed other markets with gross take up above historical benchmarks resulting in strong rental growth. In Sydney, prime net face rents increased by 3.9% over the year, driven primarily by the South and Central West submarkets. Withdrawal of stock for change of use saw vacancy fall and building quality improve, resulting in upward pressure on rents in these markets. In Melbourne, strong leasing activity saw average prime net face rents increase 5% over the period, with incentives for prime grade stock trending down to 16% from 25% a year ago. <clears throat> Across the sector, increased valuations were driven by elevated demand from domestic and foreign capital for relatively attractive yields, with over $5 billion of transactions reported in FY18, and improved transport and warehousing business conditions driven by growing demand from retailer and logistics operators. Land values in Sydney continue to reach new heights, increasing on average by 26% year on year, underpinned by strong population growth, accommodative zoning and planning changes, and a shortfall of industrial land. The Melbourne industrial land market remains strong, benefiting from solid population growth, residential construction, and improved business confidence. Land values across Melbourne increased 49% year on year in response to land shortage and yield compression. Going forward, we expect future ARES industrial portfolio returns to be underpinned by increased demand from tenants positioning themselves to benefit from increased e-commerce activity, persisting low availability of industrial stock on market relative to demand, increased demand from offshore capital supporting current valuations, and large commitments by state governments in infrastructure projects, which will not only boost efficiency of industrial operations and support demand, but also create opportunities for new and existing precincts. In all, we are comfortable with prospects for high quality industrial assets to perform well, which bodes well for the high quality ARET portfolios. I'll now hand over to Pete, who will run through other key ARET events. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> other events that have impacted the sector over the past year have been quite significant. Obviously, Westfield and Unibuy, the merger that occurred, that's significant in that the Westfield Lowy family exited the ARET sector after 58 years in late May. URW provides a long-term track record of managing shopping centres with sustainable rental growth underpinning their distribution yield, which is currently 6.4%. Based on APN's income and risk focus, the merged URW presents a more compelling investment opportunity than what was presented previously from Westfield. Obviously, investor office has been very topical for some time. Blackstone offered $5.15 in May this year when the NTA of IOF was $4.95. In June, that NTA was updated to $5.48. A bidding war has since ensued which has seen Blackstone increase their offer to $5.52. Back in June, we wrote a note that publicly suggested a fair price was $5.60, inclusive of the 10 cent distribution that has been received. Obviously, we're happy where bidding is at currently. Other events that have occurred is, have been Aventus internalization proposal for investors which is to be voted on later this month, and national storage raising 175 million in new capital back in August. The sector continues to provide opportunities for investors, such as APN. Back Thanks, to you, Pete. Mike. Thanks, Pete. So A-read balance sheets. CFOs have been very active and busy over the last 12 months. Gearing in the sector is down to 25.9%, the lowest level since 1999. Some entities' debt costs have risen marginally due to higher market rates, but they've also risen because longer duration of debt is more expensive. 
and the 9.4 billion of debt issuance done from the key AREIT names in 2018 has been done at an average tenor of 9.1 years. So that duration has actually extended the average debt term seen in the AREIT sector out to 5.1 years. You overlay that with a high level of hedging at around 80%. And you can see that the security of earnings um, is quite high in the sector. Overall, balance sheets are in good shape. In terms of market outlook and risks, GDP is sitting at strong levels and likely to be a tailwind for property going forward. Property markets are in good shape. Vacancy rates for office are low helped by strong demand and withdrawal of space in recent years. And retail sales are set to bounce if wages growth can increase and household inflation can moderate. Stronger investment de demand is likely and population growth is likely to be central to ongoing overall prosperity. In terms of downside risks, well, the omnipresent geopolitical issue, uh, trade war, discussion and risk, and locally the residential supply, oversupply issue may well spill over into a modest wealth effect impact. We don't see that risk as significant. The other risk, of course, is a stronger US stimulates interest rates globally flowing into Australia. On balance, we see risks to the upside with steady growth and low inflation typifying the market. In terms of market outlook in risk, it's always worth revisiting history to put market, the market in perspective. This graph shows the history of the standard deviation of the sector going back to 2002. And in that pre-GFC period, the market was genuinely typified by low gearing, low active earnings, corporate style earnings, and low offshore earnings. But by 2005 and 2006, this was changing. And that change manifests in the rise in the standard deviation of the sector, which spikes through that GFC period. Higher gearing, higher corporate earnings, and high offshore um, asset bases complicated the sector. Since then, the sale of those assets overseas and those businesses has simplified the sector. Lower gearing and more intensive balance sheet management have manifested in lower, lower risk and higher quality cash flows. From a risk return perspective, the A-REIT sector outlook is attractive. And that attraction can be described by valuation indicators. Key value indicators indicate or show here UBS valuations on the top left, suggesting the sector is trading around fair value. On a more simple metric, that is the yield versus the risk free rate or 10 year bond, the sector is trading at around spreads that it has always traded at with a reasonable buffer. APN valuations suggest the sector trading at around a 6% discount to fair value. I'll pass back to Pete Morrissey now to wrap up with an outlook. Thanks, Mike. So in summary, we think the fundamentals of the market, the transparent and secure property markets in Australia that present high occupancy and steady rental growth. Further NTA growth is also anticipated, but this is likely to moderate going forward. With forecast GDP growth of over 3%, this is a good result for property and underpin, underpins the sustainable rental growth going forward. The Australian economy is still expanding, which is good for property. With a 6% forecast FY19 dividend yield, for the APNA REIT fund, the income side is well covered. With the market yield spread to the risk-free rate 
of 260 basis points remains above the long-term averages and provides a capital buffer to interest rate rises. APM valuations imply capital upside at the current pricing levels, with the demand for the underlying assets remaining strong, and this is supporting the capital values. The strong balance sheets, which are conservatively geared, are a major plus for investors, as is the diversified and intensive management of borrowing, borrowings, which is in place and monitored by the AREITs. We believe that a total return of 9 to 11 per cent can be expected from the AREIT sector over the next 12 months. Back to you, Simone. Thank you, team. Well, that now takes us to Q&A. And the first question that's come through is, why did AREIT debt costs increase over the period? So perhaps if I throw that one to you, Peter, Pete Morrissey. Thanks, Sim. We saw a marginal increase in debt costs up to 4.6%, which was about 10 basis points higher, so very minimal. The pleasing thing was, though, that over the period, $9 billion worth of debt was refinanced at terms, though, of up to, on average, 9.1 years. So this increase, obviously, in long-term debt provides so much more security for investors and the trusts themselves on the cash flows. So we saw that as a real benefit and just prudent debt management by the trusts. At the end of the day, with a 5.5 year debt term, they are very well insulated for the higher interest rate cycle. Thanks very much, Pete. Another question that's come through is asking, what has the impact of Amazon been on the retail market so far? Michael Dogel, do you think we could get a, a response from you on that one? Thanks, Simone. Look, it's a good question. Um, it's fair to say that um, Amazon was probably a fairly inglorious um, debut in Australia. Um, having said that, we don't expect them to uh, to go slowly in this market. We think the arrival of uh, Prime, Amazon Prime, is going to herald um, a higher level of uh, competition. But I think what's clear from overseas examples is the arrival of a new entrant, a powerful new entrant like Amazon, um, the first uh, level of, of impact is very much on the incumbent online retailers. So we expect over time uh, Amazon to, to take a, a large share of the online trade that exists at the moment. Um, from there, it starts to impact the lesser quality uh, retail. And so by that in Australia, we're talking about um, you know, high streets, and, and you see great examples of that around Melbourne that we're very familiar with, you know, the, the high streets that once serviced that, um, you know, the, the seconds um, apparel um, market and the bulk sort of apparel market, you're seeing sort of 20% vacancy rates and 50% and falls in rents in some of those, um, those strip um, centres, the high street centres. And so that's the, the second order of, of impact. And then the third impact, of course, is the lesser quality enclosed centres, so the, the sub-regional centres that are neither, you know, um, convenient or a great experience and entertainment sort of experience. And so, you know, they're the centres that we typically will try to avoid, um, where we try to focus on the best quality convenience um, and, and experience assets. Having said all of that, um, the examples overseas are interesting. Canada is a great example where um, Amazon moved into that market, haven't made enormous inroads, albeit that it's right on the front door of um, the United States where Amazon obviously um, dominates. Um, so, so it doesn't necessarily mean that Amazon's a behemoth in the US, that it means it's going to be a behemoth in, in Australia. So look, we're cautious um, and we're not ignoring the potential impact of Amazon, but to date, um, we, we don't see a great impact and, and there are, are reasons to be still confident in the best quality real estate, um, retail real estate in Australia. 
Thanks, Michael. The next question that's come through is asking, when will the new office supply in Sydney and Melbourne impact the market? Mark, perhaps if I throw this one to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Simone. Look, excellent question. Obviously, office market income returns are heavily dependent on the supply and demand cycle, which can be quite lumpy. Certainly, we've seen that in the past. I might just start with um, the supply timing question uh, in Sydney. I guess about six to 12 months ago, a number of projects were first anticipated to finally deliver in the 2020 and 2021 uh, calendar years and now some progressive revisions to those timelines suggest that delivery might actually occur over a longer more elongated period um, from say 2020 right out to 2022. Down to Melbourne look a similar type scenario with some key development scheduled to complete in 2019-2020 um, and that's really in response to a historically low vacancy level that we've seen uh, in this market in particular. It's probably worth noting, of course, that the supply that is scheduled to come online in 2019 in particular is 100% pre-committed. And then in 2020, it's around 80% pre-committed. And then the developments that have called it, been called out to deliver in 2021 are around that 50% pre-committed. So largely de-risked um, from a perspective of uh, rental um, risk from further vacancy. Having said that, uh, we do acknowledge that there will be some, some increase in vacancy in both Sydney and Melbourne as this supply wave hits, um, albeit from historically low levels. But we're at, over the view that the vacancy level can stay at around that 6% level, certainly what research suggests, which is again below the long-term equilibrium of around 7 to 8%, uh, which still enables uh, a, a runway for some further rental growth in our opinion. Terrific, thanks Mark. Well another good question that's come through is which sector of the A-REIT market do you expect to outperform in the next few years? Who would like to answer that one? Well if I can have a crack to start with you'd probably have to expect that um, you know if you go through the largest sector obviously retail is a sector that is in the um, uh, the cyclical slowdown, um, if you like. Um, we've got low inflation that feeds through to low wages growth, that feeds through to low uh, retail sales growth. There is no forecast at the moment saying inflation is going to pick up. There is going to be no or little pressure on wages growth. So therefore, you probably expect, you know, the this cycle that we're in for retail to remain fairly benign. Having said that, it's still around sort of 3%. ABS retail sales are still around 3%. So it's not terrible, but the reality is retail is going to still be considered in the middle of this cyclical slowdown. Um, it, it, it's probably not industrial, so it's probably office. Um, Mark might have you know a comment on, on that. Yeah, sure. Look, I think we've seen over the last few years, in particularly Sydney and Melbourne, which is the bulk of, of the A-rate office, look through exposure, it's at around that 77% um, for, for A-rate portfolios. And while we've seen market rents tick up by the 10 to 15% on a net effective basis year on year, we haven't seen that come through in the, the net operating income on a like for like for the pure office names. Um, and that doesn't suggest that it won't. Um, it just probably points to the fact that A-REIT occupancies on the office portfolio sides are, are, are quite high. So um, as the A-REITs are able to, to get leverage to those increased market rents, I think you'll see the NOIs uh, be able to be marked to market. And you're gonna see um, maybe a sustained sort of leverage to that increasing market rental line. So office is well-placed um, from that perspective, I think. And industry, I think, is well placed as part of the growth in online. It's going to benefit from that and the logistics side of things going forward. The valuations that we see uh, have been very aggressive and the uh, industrial or logistics asset class is very well bid and sought after both domestically and by offshore investors. So that's probably pretty well positioned. It's a much smaller component of the A-REIT index, but uh, should continue to provide pretty solid returns going forward. Terrific. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us and we hope that you found it helpful.
A copy of the recording together with a reporting season article will be available on our website shortly. But if you do have any further questions or feedback, please feel free to email us at apnpg at apngroup.com.au or call us on 1800 996 456 and we'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. So thank you once again for joining us and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.